So welcome everyone. Welcome to Conversations in Science hosted by the Buffalo Museum of Science. My name is Gabrielle and I will be your moderator this evening. Uh, before we start, a few housekeeping items. The presentation is being recording, recorded right now. Um, you just heard the chime. You can turn on and off your videos as you like, but everyone will be muted unless I unmute you for Q&A. Please use the chat function to send questions to me and I will relay them to our speaker at the end. Um, and you can also raise your hand by clicking on the participant list, hovering over your name and raising your hand and I'll call on you during Q&A for that. So uh, we'd like to thank RP Oak Hill Building Company for their continued support and presenting sponsorship of Conversations in Science. It's the support of our sponsors, donors, and members that enable us to continue our mission and serve our community. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Melanie Garcia. Melanie is a third year PhD candidate with a Bachelor's of Science in Health Science from California State University, Long Beach. Garcia moved to Buffalo in 2018 to pursue her career goals of working in cancer research. When she discovered Roswell Park, she knew that this program would help her gain valuable hands-on experience to prepare her for her future. Witnessing the varying effects and outcomes cancer has on her family inspired her to study cancer epidemiology and prevention as her focus. She is looking forward to growing and learning as a student scientist in the years to come. And so with that, I will turn it over to Melanie and will begin. Great. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Just like Gabrielle said, she introduced me very well. My name is Melanie. I am a PhD candidate at the Roswell Park program affiliated with University of Buffalo. And I'm really excited to give this talk today. I've never done a talk via a virtual platform, so it should be interesting. And today I'm going to be talking about preventing certain health complications through vaccines. We're all living through the current coronavirus 19 pandemic, and we kind of know that there's so many questions that are left unanswered, leaving a lot of us feeling frustrated and kind of hopeless. Um, however, I'm here to talk today about preventing other kinds of health complications that are still arising um, today, and um, of despite of the coronavirus pandemic. And these are things that can't be prevented with the appropriate resources. So I'm here to talk about preventing cancer through vaccines and studying the long-term health benefits of vaccinating a virus called human papillomavirus. So just a little bit about me, Gabrielle kind of already explained it, but I'm doing my PhD currently. I'm in the cancer prevention and control track at Roswell Park. And the reason why I wanted to study cancer sciences was because uh, both of my parents were actually, uh, they're current cancer survivors. My dad suffered through kidney cancer and my mom through breast cancer. So I've always been kind of interested to see um, underlying health conditions and looking at how specific risk factors affect quality of life. So I also wanted to be a contribution to the change in the advancements of cancer science as well. My topic's going to be focusing on improving vaccination uptakes among underserved populations across Western New York in the United States currently. And I did receive my Bachelor's of Science in California. So I moved to Buffalo around two years ago and not to lie, it was kind of a transition going from an area that's always sunny and 70 degree weather to dealing with the cold. So it was a rough transition in the beginning, but now I'm actually really starting to enjoy the East Coast so far. So I still have a couple of years left to enjoy it, thankfully. Okay, so just to start off my presentation. So let's kind of think about the current situations that we're all battling with COVID-19 in the United States. So. The coronavirus actually has many different strains, and the new one that we are currently dealing with in the U.S. is SARS-2, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So it's a new strain of coronavirus that we don't have the medical or preventative strategies for currently. So because of this, it's up to us to kind of use more of like a behavioral therapy to it. So things like, of course, wearing masks, washing your hands, staying six feet away from others to maintain social distancing, and avoiding large gatherings indoors. So this is kind of what our world could look like if we, um, if we don't know how to quite yet tackle a new virus in our body. And we're still kind of understanding the immune response to COVID-19 once someone contracts it or if they're able to contract it a second time. So there's so many questions that are still left unanswered. 
So you've been probably hearing in the news or people like your friends and family about something called an antibody test. So I've been hearing across like all around New York, I've been hearing a lot of my friends saying like, oh my gosh, I wish I had the antibodies in my immune system just so that way I can like live normal life without fear and I can go back to hugging and kissing and doing whatever and living normal life again, which in this case, a lot of people are really hoping for soon. This isn't to be confused with the diagnostic test of coronavirus, which is pretty much just saying at that specific point in time when you got tested, it'll only tell you if you had coronavirus at that specific point in time. Whereas the antibody test can kind of let you know more whether or not you've been exposed to the virus and if your body's immune system developed the antibodies to fight it off if you were to get a secondary infection. So just like what I said before, this is kind of what our world would look like without vaccines present and without the appropriate pharmaceutical measures to control the population spread of infection. And it is still only normal to be worried and cautious about contracting COVID-19. Throughout this time though, I think people are often forgetting about other health aspects that you could be focusing on as well. So it's not, because COVID-19 is a very serious thing to be worrying about, I think a lot of people are kind of forgetting about other aspects of their health as well. So I'm kind of here today to kind of remind everyone that there are still th certain things that you can prevent, although you can't prevent COVID-19 from happening right away with the appropriate pharmaceutical strategies. There are other things that you can pre um, prevent currently. So just like I talked about before with my current dissertation topic, sorry, I'm going to be talking about preventing against a virus called human papillomavirus or HPV for sure. I'll be referring to it as HPV for the rest of the presentation. This isn't to be confused with HIV, which is human immunodeficiency virus. It, this is another virus that is a lot more common around the globe than people may actually think. So what exactly is HPV? It's a sexually transmitted infection and is typically passed on through genital skin to skin contact. It affects roughly 80% of sexually active individuals throughout their lifetime. So just like I said before, it is a very, very common infection and roughly 79 million Americans in the US are infected with HPV at any point in their lifetime as well. So just like I was kind of saying before with COVID-19, I'm gonna be kind of comparing it just so people can kind of shift gears to understanding HPV as well. Uh, COVID just has met some, not many strains as HPV, but HPV is not a disease or infection that you should be generalizing just as one type of virus. It has many different kinds of strains. There's actually, a hundreds of strains, I can't remember all the numbers behind them right now, but most strains of HPV are able to clear out of your body within one to two years. But there's other HPV types of strains that are able to um, result in a lot of adverse health outcomes as well, which is what I'm going to be talking about in the um, next upcoming slides. And these can leave really long lasting negative health outcomes as well. So here's just a brief overview of what happens when you contract HPV. I know there's a lot going on in this photo. So um, for this part, just focus on the part I boxed out in red. So typically when you contract HPV, it's gonna infect the cells that are lining the organ of interest that's infected. So in this um, picture right here, the cells are gonna be infected for the lining of the cervix of a female. And it can also affect under other genital tracts for both males and females. And it could also infect so sorry, I didn't, I need to backtrack a little bit. So this part is infecting the epithelial cells that are outlining the cervix. So usually epithelial cells are the surface of the skin for the organ of interest. And then there's going to be cells that it's protecting in the inside of that organ as well. And I'll start getting into the more of the nitty gritty of that later. HPV can also infect the mucosal layers. And the mucosal layer is usually a layer that's outlining an organ that's in your respiratory tract. So examples of these are like in the oral pharyngeal area or like the throat, for example. So then what's happening when HPV is contracted is that either the epithelial or mucosal barrier of the skin that's protecting that organ um, ends up being infected with the DNA. So it's going to in integrate ex itself into the surface layer of the skin and then slowly go into the infected basal cells and where the basal cells are more deeply into this organ of interest as well. And I know there's also a lot going on in this slide right here, so just kind of take a moment to digest it. And I'm gonna try my best to um, make it as simplified as possible just because I know there's a lot going on. Okay, so for those don't who don't have a scientific background, 
There are many, many types of proteins in the human body. And the roles of these proteins are to keep our cells healthy and regulated. And this whole entire process right here can also be like a separate other class. So I'm not going to get too into the detail of it, but it's just so you guys can kind of picture what is going on inside of your body when you contract HPV. So in HPV, there are proteins. Those two proteins are called E6 and E7, which are circled on the top in the blue. And these proteins, for another word, are oncoproteins or consider them like cancerous proteins as you will. And then let's kind of shift gears a bit. So then if you see in the green, there's two um, other proteins called P53 and retinoblastoma or RB for short or PRB for short as well. The role of these two proteins, they work very similarly together. So I'm not going to explain the exact biological mechanisms because that can take a couple hours for you guys to bear through. But pretty much these proteins work by monitoring over your body's cell cycle. And what your cell cycle is typically doing is looking over each step and seeing whether or not they can detect DNA that's damaged or cells that are kind of acting a little bit funky. So before these cells can go into the rest of the cell cycle and replicate into your entire body, the role of P53 and retinoblastoma are to look at these proteins and suppress them and eliminate them before they can continue on to the cell cycle and divide and take over your body as unhealthy cells. The bad part about this is with the presence of E6 and E7, these two proteins are able to overrule the functions of these tumor suppressor genes, RB and P53. So what happens is that they don't, um, they're not allowing RB and 53 to do their jobs of either triggering programmed cell death or apoptosis to kill the unhealthy cell. And retinoblastoma is also not able to monitor any kind of weird things that are going on in the body as well. So E6 and E7 are very dangerous, and these are typically present when HPV occurs. So they're allowing these damaged DNA cells that are damaged from HPV to continue on and replicate in your body, hence why these cancerous cells are producing more in your body versus healthy cells. And then it's allowing these, the cancer to proliferate and continue to grow instead of suppressing it when needed. And then this leads to the outgrowth of cells that are unregulated and can lead to things like an abnormal mass, whether benign or cancerous. And just like I was saying before, many different kinds of HPV strains are able to clear out of your body within one to two years. So some people tend to wonder, like, if HPV is so common, what, what's the big deal? And how does it pose a threat to my long-term health if it's super common and it will clear out of my system? That's not a really healthy way to think, though, because here are the reasons. So there's many different strains, but these specific strains are the ones that are going to be extremely alarming. So let's kind of focus on the one that's circled out in blue right now. These strains are called strains 6 and 11 and are key risk factors and result in about 90% of genital warts, which are not very healthy for the body. They're considered low risk and they're commonly forming like the genital tract in both males and females. And since these are considered low risk, the appropriate medical treatment will typically help treat them and to prevent the spread. So outcomes of these are just abnormal changes to the skin, such as like dysplasia in the cervix and developing an abnormal mass. This mass most of the times is benign or those don't really, people don't, who don't know what benign means, it's pretty much a non-cancerous um, mass in your skin. The part of this that's not good though is that not a lot of them present many symptoms. You typically will know you have these unless or when you're actually looking down there and checking as well. So if you present no symptoms but you're not really self-monitoring, you have the potential to spread these warts to many other sexual partners with the increasing number of sexual partners you have. Hence why the number of sexual partners is um, a really big risk factor for HPV. So this is low risk and can clear out with the appropriate medical treatment if needed. So again, some people might be wondering, okay, this is, this is not a big deal, but you do not want to be spreading this to other people as well. That can also not be a very good thing. But then we're looking at, hold on, let me, there we go. Okay, so this is the next one that's going to be one of the worst things to your health. So HPV strains 16 and 18 are two numbers that you should be very familiar with. And these are very, very dangerous to your overall health. So type 16 and 18 in comparison to 6 and 11 are considered high risk HPV types and are precursors to many types of associated cancers. So if you're diagnosed with either 16 or 18, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have the cancer of interest at that point in time but your risks for developing it in the future are much, much, much higher. 
than those who okay. aren't exposed to HPV 16 and 18. So then this is the same chart I just showed before, but I'm gonna be boxing out the right of it. So in the case where you do contract the strain 16 and 18 of HPV, this can be extremely dangerous, of course. I don't really like to focus too much on percentage because it, some people might think that less than 1% developing cancer is not a huge deal. Like, okay, what's my risk if the percentage is so low? I kind of like to put into perspective with like the number aspect. So a lot of people, I think going back to COVID-19, I think a lot of people are saying like, oh, only 1% of the population is getting HPV, or sorry, is getting coronavirus within like the entire world. So there's only like a 1% positivity rate what's the big deal? Like, I'm not going to get sick. And there's not a lot of people dying. When you put it into perspective, there's millions of people in that 1% that are still getting those fatal cases and are still passing away from this. So I think a lot of people need to consider that even though it might not seem like a lot, groups of people are still groups of people. So you still have to take that into consideration when looking at your health. Okay, so what are some of the risk factors exactly? I like to break up risk factors into these two things. So the biological um, risk factors, so examples of these. So one of them would be a weakened immune system. So people who have a weakened immune system or technically considered immunocompromised don't really have the strength in their immune system to fight off infection. So example of people who are immunocompromised are including those who previously had some other type of cancer who underwent therapy like radiation or chemotherapy that's really damaging to your immune system and it's very toxic to the body. So your body is a lot weaker to fight off these infections and the same thing with HIV positive patients. So these patients, if they were to contract HPV, are even at a higher risk for developing secondary malignancies in the future as well. So it's really alarming for these groups of people specifically. And then co-infections with other STIs. I'm not going to get too into like the biology behind it, but being um, having exposure to different types of sexually transmitted infections can also increase your risk of HIV, which can also kind of tailor into the behavioral aspect. So if people are engaging in unhealthy sexual behaviors and are getting STIs in the other ways, their risks for contracting HPV will also be higher due to this as well. And then some behavioral aspects. So just kind of like I stated before, the number of sexual partners as well. So like with increasing number of sexual partners, your risk for contracting HPV are going to be much higher, especially because the infection is so common and sexual behaviors as well. So if you're engaging in sexual activity behaviors with people that you aren't really like, you don't really know too well, you don't really know their, their past history with other sexual partners, this can also increase the risk as well. And I kind of also wanted to touch base on, some people might be wondering like, how come this person develops like type 16 and 18 and how come this one develops 6 and 11 and this other person has a different strain that no one even knows about? I'm still not even sure the answer behind that and I'm still researching that to this day so I won't be able to answer the exact mechanism behind that but just know that there's researchers out there that are focusing on that and it's still kind of unanswered at that point at least from my understanding but these things still pose a risk and that's the main point right here. Okay, so let's focus on these high-risk HPV strains. So just like I've been stating throughout the whole presentation, most cases are able to clear out. But in that rare case where it's not and you contract these oncogenic strains, your risk for developing these types of cancers listed below are much, much higher. So I think a lot of people associate HPV with cervical cancer, which of course it causes almost all cervical cancer cases are associated with HPV, just like the other um, genital and gynecologic cancers as well that are associated with it. Rates of cervical cancer are very, very slowly decreasing, but the decrease is not significant enough to say, okay, it's probably not posing an issue right now. It still poses a huge issue and contracting these two HPV strains is super, super dangerous for cervical cancer risk. The alarming part is the oral pharyngeal cancer. So there's a lot of studies now that I've been reading up on that are saying that oral pharyngeal cancers that are associated with HPV are increasing within the years and it's increasing more in men than it is in women as well. So some people don't really take oral pharyngeal cancers into consideration because they don't really pose it as a big risk. And technically speaking too, these cancers that are as a result of HPV have a better prognostic factor than those that might be associated with like smoking or other risk factors that are known to be associated with oral pharyngeal cancers. 
but the HPV types are the ones that are increasing now. So we don't know if 10 to 20 years from now, the prognostic factor of HPV associated oral pharyngeal cancers are gonna be worse than tobacco in the next years to come. So we still have to think about it as a future standpoint and not, be, and not think of it from like a narrow standpoint of, okay, this doesn't pose a risk to me because of X, Y, and Z. These things are still an issue and I'll be talking more about the risk factors to them later on. Okay, so let's look at cervical cancer for a bit. Okay, so cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women and accounts for about 7.5% of related deaths worldwide. And then in the United States, around 12,000 women will be diagnosed with cervical cancer each year. I know 12,000 doesn't seem like a lot, and that's just because the United States is technically considered like a high income country, and we have more accessibility like screening, such as pap smears, and there's more of like a routine checkup for cervical cancer versus like oral pharyngeal cancers where people are typically screened only if they show symptoms. So it's good that cervical cancer is more, people are more aware of it now just because of the routine screenings that women typically go through. The reason why it's most commonly diagnosed in women ages 30 years or older is just because these symptoms present much later. So typically symptoms of cervical cancer won't, it depends on the case tip obviously, but in most circumstances, these symptoms don't really present until the cancer has spread or metastasized in the body. So it's really alarming and that kind of gives it the name of the silent killer too, because a lot of women who let's say we're diagnosed at stage zero or one, just don't either don't know they had HPV or don't know they have cervical cancer or ris like risen from their HPV. So they're gonna say, okay, it's not a big deal. And then once they go to the doctor for some type of symptom, and then they realize that that symptom was related to cervical cancer they've had for however amount of time, then that's the problem, giving it kind of the name of the silent killer because so many women don't know that they have it until it's gotten really bad. So just to give you guys a little bit more visual representation, you can see that stages zero and one, the survival rates are very good for zero and one. So it's between 85% to 100. And when I refer to five year survival rate, I'm just looking at the survival rates from initial diagnosis to five years after. So we want to see how many women are still living five years after their initial diagnosis. But if you kind of shift gears a little bit, stage is two, and above are demonstrating the cancer spreading beyond the cervix and then also having the potential to metastasize to the rectum and bladder and significantly reducing these survival rates. So we can see how fatal the disease can actually be with the later stages diagnosed as the symptoms are not presenting themselves until much later. So this is why it's so important to get your annual screenings. It's so important to be aware that this type of cancer poses an issue and to also be aware that it's so, you can, completely prevent it from happening while you can. Okay, I just wanted to also touch base on the oral pharyngeal cancers as well, because I feel like a lot of people aren't really um, too aware of this topic as well. So the oral pharynx is pretty much described with the following organs that you can see on this chart above. So things like the tongue, the tonsils, the uvula, the nose obviously, the larynx, also known as the voice box, the pharynx or the esophagus. And then most of these cancers, just to give you guys a brief overview, because I think there's so many different kinds of cancers with different names, different things that people just tend to get um, a little bit overwhelmed with, it, which is completely understandable. So these cancers are typically called squamous cell carcinomas. So squamous cell carcinomas are cancers that form in the skin or the tissue cells that are lining the body's organs. This isn't to be confused with a different kind of cancer. So you might hear, for example, let's say sarcomas. Sarcomas are typically cancers that are formed in body's connective tissue. So like things like flat and the blood vessels and your nerves. Squamous cell carcinomas are just gonna be the cells that are, um, that are lining these organs of interest as well, just to give it, make it a little bit more clear. So although these squamous cell carcinomas that are directly associated with HPV do have a better prognosis than some that arise from tobacco or smoking, it is becoming more increasingly common in men than women. And just kind of like I stated before, the screenings are not typically routine like it would be for like cervical cancer or even breast cancer. But we just really need to remember that these rates are increasing in relation to HPV as well. So again, we don't know later along the line if it's gonna become a bigger issue than cervical cancer or if the prognostic factor is gonna be worse than smoking. There's so much that's unknown. So why not protect 
getting these types of cancers while you can. Just gonna drink water really quick. So it just comes to the question of cancer or no cancer. I would hope that everyone would want to lean towards no cancer. So I'm just going to be talking about ways that you can prevent these cancers from occurring. Oops, I'm a little skinny there. <laughs> okay, so just how to protect against HPV and associated health outcomes. So the current key primary prevention strategy is, of course, the HPV vaccine. So the vaccine was approved by the FDA in 2006 for females and then shortly after in 2011 for males. So it is a relatively new vaccine. And I think the issue that comes with the low vaccination rates in the states is that some people, like whether you're a parent, you're just on your own, whatever your case may be, a lot of people are kind of hesitant on the fact that it's such a new vaccine. And they're not really sure of like, okay, is it really effective? Like, how do I not know? I'm, or how do I know I'm not going to get these really bad adverse um, side effects, this, that, or the other. I just want people to know that the FDA goes through many, many, many different rounds of protocols, a lot of approvals, crazy stuff in order to make sure that the vaccines that are being administered in the U.S. are safe and effective. So I would say over 15,000 people were on these clinical trials um, testing this vaccine and seeing whether or not it was effective. And I'll talk about more of the reduction in these associated health outcomes with different countries in the, um, later on. But this vaccine so far is one of the most, uh, the best and most effective primary prevention strategies for HPV. So the younger you are when vaccinating is gonna be much better. So the CDC recommends for both boys and girls between 11 and 12 year old, years old to get vaccinated against this virus. So the reason why they want the vaccination so early on is because they want to do a primary prevention approach. So they want to prevent HPV from occurring or HPV from developing in your system um, before it can even happen. So a lot of kids that are from 11 to 12 most likely haven't had sex yet. So if you're vaccinated against HPV and provide your body the antibodies to fight off the virus before they're exposed to it, it's going to be much better. And the vaccine is administered in two doses before you're 15 years old, but you're gonna need an additional booster dose when you're between the ages of 15 to 26. So even though it's still gonna be um, a good prevention strategy for people that are older than 11 to 12, this is like the um, kind of like the preferred age window to get it. I think, so it's saying that three doses are required between 15 to 26. It's not necessarily frowned upon to get the vaccine after 26. It's just the problem is that a lot of people that are 26 and over have probably most likely already been exposed to HPV. Whether or not they were most exposed to a bad type or not, they're still going to be exposed to it. So the vaccine is not going to work by preventing it when it's already there. So it doesn't treat an existing infection. And that's what people really need to understand. But I think if you talk to your healthcare provider, if you're older than 26 and kind of explain your own personal health needs, they're going to be the ones to really tell you whether or not you'll benefit from it or not. But overall, these are all the suggestions that are approved by the CDC and vaccinating earlier is much better so you can prevent diseases before they occur. So even due to the effectiveness of the vaccine, the vaccine uptake remains low in the United States still. So there's a website called Healthy People 2020, and what they do is kind of just um, list off like certain health recommendations based off the critical health condition they're talking about. And they recommended that 80% of adolescents in the U.S. vaccinate HP against HPV. And this kind of comes with the topic of herd immunity. So like saying that two people are vaccinated against a specific health condition, their likelihood of um, kind of contracting it between one another is going to be much more lower versus the two people that don't have the vaccination or only one person that's vaccinated. Just like we're talking about with the COVID-19 vaccine as well. But with this, only half or only over half of girls and less than half of boys between 13 to 17 are fully vaccinated. But then we can see like other countries, for example, Australia, have shown significant reduction in these associated health outcomes due to HPV after they implemented a national vaccination program throughout the entire country. So I don't really remember exactly what everything entailed. I believe they did a school-based entry requirement for the vaccine and then other kinds of um, implementation strategies as well. But if you see trends over time with Australia, their outcomes for these um, types of cancers, genital warts, X, Y, and Z, 
have become so much better over time too. So this can kind of just show how effective the vaccine actually is. Okay, so just to go back with my whole antibody talk. So we've all been hearing the word antibody and how everyone's somehow wishing that they had COVID-19 antibodies. But you could get HPV, um, HPV antibodies too, which is a great thing to know about. So I'm just going to talk about what antibodies exactly do, because I think some people might be a little confused as to what exactly an antibody is. So with the vaccine, the vaccine is going to work by stimulating the body cells in the immune system to produce these antibodies. So an antibody is a protein. And just look at, so the figure that I included to the right, look at the little guy that's kicking that red cell. Think of that guy, or I don't, you can call him a ninja, whatever you want to call him. Think of him as the antibody right now. So the antibody is a protein, and I like to think of it as like a guard that's looking over the genome of the organ that is infected. So it's going to kind of monitor it over and see like, okay, let's look if there is anything we see that's kind of fishy around the immune system. So something like an unwanted visitor. And in that case, that unwanted visitor, which is what this little ninja guy is kicking right now, is going to be the HPV-infected DNA. Or for more proper terms, an infectious pathogen. And these are known to be harmful and to develop the adverse health outcomes that we might be seeing with HPV. So this antibody is going to recognize the pathogen and kind of stimulate the immune system to just fight off the HPV infection that's in present in this infected organ. So antibodies are very good and are amazing when you want to get rid of something that your body clearly does not benefit from. Okay, so just to make it a little bit easier to understand, I'm not an immunologist here, so I'm just going to go based on things I've learned from my classes. So our body has two lines of immune defense to fight off unwanted visitors or an infectious pathogen. Their first one is going to be innate immunity. So innate immunity is more of like a, like a little, how can I explain innate immunity? It's very quick. It's not a very like, it's effective, but not as effective as the next step I'll be talking about. I'll just put it that way. So innate immunity typically consists of like a physical or a mucosal barrier in the body. So just think of like if you buy new shoes and you're breaking them in, but you're still walking around in them and you can feel a lot of pain in your shoe. I've done this many, many times with new shoes I've bought. I tend to get blisters on my feet a lot. And then throughout the days, you're going to see that that blister or that open wound is going to form kind of like a bubble over the skin to protect it from getting any further infected. That can be an example of innate immunity. Or even when you're sick with a cold, your body's going to instantly start coughing and coughing just to get rid of the bacteria that's in your throat. So that's kind of an example of innate immunity. It's very immediate, it's quick, but it's not something that's permanent. In the case of HPV, the innate immune system is kind of already overlooked. So HPV is going to be like, okay, we don't, the innate immune system is already, some of the characteristics and the little, the parts of the innate immunity in HPV are often overlooked. And kind of looking back into what I was talking about with those oncoproteins called E6 and E7, these proteins have the ability to evade certain components of innate immunity. Hence why the adaptive immune system is so important as a second line of defense. So this is going to be like the backup to the innate immunity and be like, okay, that this is like, we have you, we're going to help you out. Like, don't worry, we're going to be the ones to protect you with the next upcoming thing that's going to come along. So that's when adaptive immunity comes along. So if the innate immune system, just like with HPV, somehow fails, your adaptive immune system is going to play an important role in secreting the antibodies to bind to the unwanted visitor to tell it to go away by destroying or clearing it out of the infected site. So you can see, I don't know if you guys are able to see my mouse here, but cool. Okay, so this is going to be the antibody, and then let's just say this is HPV. I was, I should have labeled this, but just think of the screen thing as HPV. You can see the antibody is already looking it over, and it's going to trigger the specific immune response to get rid of this infectious pathogen, so that way it doesn't go up into your body and infect the rest of your um, immune system. And this is why antibodies, I can't emphasize enough, are so, so important with preventing disease. Okay, so I talked a bunch about the vaccine, so some people might be wondering, what, where do I get it? What is it? I, I don't even know what it's called, X, Y, and Z. So there are three common types of the vaccines that may, you may have heard of. There's Gardasil, Gardasil 9, and Cervarex. 
I believe that Gardasil 9 is the only one that's currently administered in the United States. And Gardasil 9 protects against the four oncogenic, or sorry, 16 and 18, which are the oncogenic strains, and then 6 and 11, which are the low-risk strains of HPV. It's available for both boys and girls. We'll protect against these, along with less common ones that I didn't talk about at all throughout the rest of the presentation. The reason why I didn't talk about them is because I myself am not quite educated enough to educate you guys on these last strains, but these ones are also associated with other kinds of cancers. I don't think they, their risk factors are as high as 16 and 18, but they're still included in this Gardasil 9 vaccination, which is great. So why not vaccinate against nine HPV strains instead of just four? And just like I've been saying before, all the FDA approval, everything that's been gone through in order to administer the right dosage of the vaccine, makes this vaccine over 99% effective at preventing HPV 16 and 18 associated cancers. So why this? I mean, doing prior research myself, a lot of people associate it just with cervical cancer and preventing cervical cancer, and it is over 99% at, at preventing cervical cancer. They are still understanding the mechanisms with oral pharyngeal cancers, but more clinical trials and research have been showing that it also prevents against these cancers as well. So just like I was saying before, it's important to pre um, prevent against cancers that, for one, might not have the regular screenings, and for two, may pose a threat that a lot of people don't even know pose a threat as well. And then this was just a paper. I am not going to elaborate too much on this, but in case anyone's interested, I can send you this paper. I did a presentation in my class last semester about eliminating cervical cancer globally. So. The fact that people are already considering the fact that cervical cancer can be completely eradicated across the entire world is a great thing. So I would hope that everyone would be excited about something like this. So the purpose of this paper was just using like a comparative analysis and looking at different thresholds and what people need to take in order to eliminate cervical cancer completely. So it was targeting not only high income countries, but low and middle income countries as well. So pretty much the basis of this paper was just saying, if this country implements a whole health healthcare system based with requirements of the vaccination and women get screened twice, twice at a specific time in their lives and get vaccinated against HPV, how long will it take to eliminate cervical cancer by the next century? So I'm not gonna get too much into detail about it, but it does explain a really cool way in which they can predict cervical cancer to be eliminated. And by comparative modeling analysis, I'm gonna compare again to COVID-19 like I've been doing like this entire presentation, but kind of think of how a bunch of statisticians and epidemiologists have been pre using prediction models for COVID-19 to see when the peak would happen. So I believe they were saying that with the modeling approaches they took, they predicted that our COVID, I think the peak would be hit by April 9th. And they got pretty, pretty close um, up to that number. So that's kind of like what a compare, like what modeling analysis would do is doing kind of like prediction. So it's the same thing with cervical cancer. And I can, again, I can give this paper to anyone who may, may be interested in reading it because I found it to be a very, very excellent read, just for your information. And then here are some ways I kind of like to suggest people to approach the HPV vaccine. So I like to look at, it from like a cancer prevention vaccine because I think a lot of people associate it with either just not being educated on the vaccine which is understandable because it is relatively new or being kind of afraid if you're a parent they're kind of hesitant on giving the vaccine to their child because they think it's going to encourage them to engage in sexual activity at a younger age there's so many different kinds of studies that focus on vaccine hesitancy and a lot of them are actually showing that these kids aren't really changing their sexual activity behaviors. So I would think of it as like, okay, I'm gonna prevent my child from getting cancer in the future if they were to um, wanna build a family on, on their own someday. And then just like I said, that's the same thing with kind of going long-term versus short-term, looking at your long-term health outcome versus, okay, I have HPV, but it's not gonna affect me because it'll clear out within one to two years. You have to understand that there's so many different aspects to go into it and not to generalize it, just based on numbers that you might be reading from various resources. And then looking into like health insurance coverage options. I'm not a healthcare professional, so I can't really suggest how exactly to access it based on whether what your health insurance status is. So I think talking to your healthcare provider 
and seeing whether or not they have the resources for you to go get the vaccine at little to no cost if, you, if that is your circumstance. Those open communications with healthcare providers are also very important. And just remembering that it is a safe vaccine to administer as well. And just some key take home points, like I've been saying, very, very common virus. You do not wanna have it and you don't wanna um, underestimate it, its, its effects that it can have on your body. Vaccine is very safe and it's most effective as a primary prevention strategy. So this vaccine is not going to be preventing something that's already occurred. That's something that people really need to understand. And there are ways to receive the vaccine. So just open communication with your healthcare provider and finding ways to get the vaccine. And then with that, hopefully everyone is staying healthy and doing the appropriate stuff during these crazy times. I know it seems long, but just hang in there and we'll all be a team and hopefully beat this crazy virus that's currently going on and not forgetting that other aspects of your health also matter. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was terrific. Um, so I have dropped some links in the chat, uh, one for healthypeople.gov forward slash 2020. And then if anyone on the call would like a copy of that paper, my email address is, well, it's posted on the website for conversations in science, but it's also in the chat. So just email me um, and I can get you that copy from Melanie. So uh, we're going to open it up for question and answer now. Uh, you're welcome to type your questions in the chat or if you would like to use the hand raise function to come on and ask your question um, through your microphone, you're welcome to do that. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to mention before I kind of open it up for the rest of the guests is that um, this really ties in with something that we talked about last week in a conversation in science about risk assessment. And so oh, thinking yeah. about how much risk you can bear and what is the benefit of bearing that risk? And so in, in the instance of being vaccinated against HPV, um, it really seems like the prevention of cancer is a huge benefit. And whether or not your concerns about vaccines outweigh a fear of developing cancerous cells down the line um, is definitely something to consider. So I, I just thought that was that was something that jumped out that I thought, yeah, oh. Yeah, so it's, it's really important. And again, like I sympathize with people who might be afraid of what like side effects vaccines have, especially with all like the stuff that happened back in the 90s with the whole vaccine causes autism thing, which obviously with the, um, the study that was fabricated by, I can't even remember the name of the person who wrote the, the paper. So it's an understandable thing. Like I even talked to my parents about it. Back then it was a very scary issue, but I think now with such advancement in science that anything you do in life, you're going to have a risk. So getting a vaccine, a risk, there's a risk with every single thing you do. So I think that's kind of like what I like to tell people as well. And I think that's a great point too, to segue into our Q&A because a lot of the concern was a lack of understanding and not getting your information from a reliable source. And so really the, the idea behind these conversations is to allow you know, public access to people who know a little bit more and can answer these nuanced questions. Yeah. So I'm gonna give a few moments. If anyone would like to unmute, um, you will have to ask for permission. Um, again, you can hover over your name on the participant list, or you can ask it in the chat. Um, I've got one question. So when the HPV vaccine became available, there was significant concern among adults regarding giving it to their children, mm -hmm. uh, and current stats support that. What can we learn and how can we adapt messaging and practices to increase the positive reception and response to a coronavirus vaccine, particularly because it too will be new and untested. So kind of um, people are concerned when vaccines are brand new, uh, we don't have a coronavirus vaccine right now. And so what are, what are the challenges? What are ways that we can talk to people to, you know, I think, so my opinion is, I think people really need to look at it from like an FDA standpoint, because I don't think a lot of people really know 
what the FDA does to approve these vaccines. And I've taken, I took a class back in, um, this was like a year and a half ago called Integrated Cancer Sciences. So they kind of walked us through all the FDIA, like the clinical trials, everything that goes on in order to have a vaccine approved. And I learned that like they don't approve things easy. They take, I mean, things take so, so, so long to approve. And with the clinical trial, I think people need to understand too, like how clinical trial phases work. So it's like the first one or two phases, there's going to be like obviously less people, but they add, I mean, like thousands and thousands of people to these clinical trials in phases three and four. So I think it's like looking at it from, okay, if these many people are getting, having good reactions out of these vaccines, then it should be safe. And then the FDA, FDA, they know what they're doing and they have specific procedures that go in when they have to rush a vaccine just like with this whole pandemic stuff going on now. So I think that part is a concern. I I want to say I know everything that goes into these approvals when they're going through the steps. I don't know it all on the top of my head just because it takes so long to know. But I mean it isn't it's a valid concern. Like I I'm not even downplaying anyone's feelings with that now because if it's if you get a medicine that's people some people don't know that there's so many other people that have already gotten this vaccine administered that they're kind of scared thinking that they're the first ones, which isn't typically the case. I think also we have to focus it on from a healthcare provider standpoint. So think like taking it back to HPV, there's been so many studies that show that healthcare providers don't educate their patients on the vaccine and like its effectiveness. Like they don't really talk about it like they would with like hepatitis B or any of the other common vaccines that babies get. So I think looking at it from like a provi a healthcare provider standpoint and educating them more on like, these are the benefits, this is how it's going to work, trying to find a way to understand and explain the science to a population that might not really know what exactly is going on into their body is going to be a huge indicator in encouraging people to get the vaccination as well. So I think, yeah, I, I would say from a healthcare provider standpoint, it's important for them to educate just like some people are even afraid of like antibodies because they don't really know what it is and they don't understand that antibodies are in the vaccine and will, or sorry, they don't understand that these vaccines are going to trigger your cells in the immune system to produce these antibodies to fight off really bad infections. I think some people just generally don't understand that. So it all comes with like education and how, like how for one, the FDA works and for two, how healthcare providers can give more reassurance to their patients. That's a, that's a really tremendous answer because really um, there are so many people that say, oh, well, if my doctor hasn't mentioned it or they say you could or you couldn't, like, meh, um, yeah. it, it downplays the impact that it can have on an individual's life. And there are times that we're looking for other avenues of getting good health information. I mean, I don't know how many times I have searched on WebMD about how, like, what are the symptoms that I have or what are the risks of something? And mm -hmm. so what would you recommend for people as a reliable source to, to start doing some research on your own? Are there any websites or things that you can um, say that are good for like general consumption of information, knowing yeah. that these are not a substitute for conversations yeah. with your healthcare provider? Yeah, so I would say, for one, look at a website that is a .org and not a .com is a start. So like the CDC is going to be one of the best ones or the World Health Organization. I would suggest those two or I would say, so the CDC would be one, Mayo Clinic is a great one, and then um, the World Health Organization. Those three would be my top. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So you have given us a lot of information. This is this is really good stuff to think about. The good news yeah. is that um, this has been recorded, and so people are welcome to play it back. Um, the, this and other conversations in science are going to be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, I can't remember the link right now, but you can find it through uh, sciencebuff.org. You can um, find our social media links through there. I'm really stalling for time to see if we have any other questions that are coming up. Um, but everyone seems relatively quiet this evening. Yeah, I can even provide my email too if anyone wants to ask me questions after. I know I get put on the spot when I have to ask questions over Zoom, so I get it. Yeah, absolutely. If you'd like, um, you can put your email in the chat. And I'd like to um, let everyone know that 
this is an ongoing series of conversations in science. Um, if you ever have topics that you'd like to think about or that you are interested in hearing more about, um, I'm, I, would, I would like to arrange for speakers that are, are interested um, from the general public. And I really appreciate Melanie's talk here because I was thinking about, um, I don't really know how clinical trials work, but I, I do know some people that work in uh, clinical and translational sciences, and I think that I will ask them to come and give a talk specifically about clinical trials later on. Yeah, I um, think that would be great. I think a lot of people don't really understand how insane these clinical trials are. They go through a lot of, and they, so I think from like the general standpoint, I know it's always like adding and adding and adding for each trial. So it's like phase one, they'll have like a sample of 20 participants and have a, a dosage of a certain vaccine of like very low. And then they'll just like try to add it just to develop some sort of threshold by a certain um, phase. Mm -hmm. That's all, like, I, I wish I knew way more and it can, it can be like taught in a whole different class, but that'd be a good, I think a good conversation too. Uh, we do have a question. So is there a screening for oropharyngeal cancers or is anyone working to find an appropriate screening? There's like, there's not like a direct screening. So not to compare it to like a mammogram for breast cancer, or a pap smear for cervical cancer, you could get screened for oropharyngeal cancers. It's typically through like a CT or a PET scan or a CAT scan, one of those, but that's typically shown if you're, um, I'm not really sure, they don't do like a routine screening like they would like a mammogram or pap smear. So it's not like heavily enforced. I think it's only if you're showing like um, pretty like severe symptoms when they'll, when they'll do that. So um, it wouldn't, I think, I guess I could ask, um, would it be something, so a, a pap smear, you can uh, screen with a swab and then for other screenings you need to take a biopsy do you know uh, which um, of the two it would be closer to um it would be probably closer to a biopsy i would say yeah That's but it depends they would have to do one of the scans first to see where exactly the cancer is forming in the tract so oh true yes because it would be a localized area so you would need to be able to know kind of where to pull the cells from yeah yeah it would depend so if it's like in the throat per se it, it really i think it depends on the case itself it, can go so many different ways. Sure. This is great. Yeah, this is fun. Uh, well, we are very glad to have you and I will give my closing remarks now. This brings us to the end of our program. We thank you all so much for joining us today, to Melanie Garcia for sharing your expertise, uh, to all of our participants for being here with us today and continuing your lifelong learning. Um, it's great to see your faces and some of your names. I know that there are some folks that I used to see very regularly in physical space, and so it's nice to be connected again. Uh, next week, we are going to talk about pandemics and perception. Uh, that link is also on our uh, page for Conversations in Science, and I'll put it in our chat as well. Um, and then if you would be so kind to us, we send out a survey afterwards to get uh, your reactions on what worked well and what you liked best and things that could be improved about the series overall, um, as well as whether or not this has been relevant to your life and your lifestyle. Uh, so please look for that email um, in your inboxes. So that'll be sent to the registration that you used to sign up for this program. Uh, well, thank you all very much, um, Melanie. Thank you. Thank um, you. And I'm going to stop our recording now. Uh, yeah. uh, with that, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here. And everyone take care. Stay safe. Enjoy your dinners. I smell mine coming along uh, <laughs> right now. <laughs> so thank Go you so much it. for joining us. Yes. Okay, you know, bye.